Hello everyone and welcome to this biopsychology lesson on biological rhythms, specifically circadian rhythms. So first off, I just want to give you a little bit of an introduction as to what biological rhythms actually are. So biological rhythms are cyclical changes in that they're on a cycle in the way that biological systems behave. Okay, so we all have certain rhythms, certain cycles in our body that we experience. Sometimes we experience them very, very quickly within a short period of time. Sometimes we experience them over the course of a day. Sometimes we experience them over the course of a month. But either way, there are cycles that always restart within a certain time frame. Now, we have cycles like that because the environment has cycles like that, you know, cyclical changes that come around um, all the time. So whether that's day and night or whether that's summer and winter or whatever, the environment around us has cyclical changes. And so we have cyclical changes in order to optimize how we behave in the environment. Now, the most important cyclical change or biological rhythm that humans experience is called a circadian rhythm. So circadian rhythms are cycles that last for 24 hours. Now, bearing in mind what I just said about the environment having cycles as well, 24 hours is the length of a day. Okay, now nearly all organisms possess some kind of biological re representation of a 24-hour day. Now having a circadian rhythm of 24 hours optimizes any organism's physiology and behavior to meet the varying demands of the night-day cycle that everybody experiences. So it tells our bodies when to sleep. It tells our bodies when to get up, when to eat, um, when to release hormones, um, what temperature your body should be at, what time of the day. All of these are circadian rhythms that optimize our body's performance over a 24-hour cycle. Now, all of our circadian rhythms are driven by body clocks. And body clocks are found in all of the cells of the body and are synchronized by what's known as the master circadian pacemaker. And that's known as the SCN, which stands for the suprachiasmatic nuclei, which is found in the hypothalamus. You can see it on the image right there, suprachiasmatic nucleus or nuclei, which is sat there where the hypothalamus is. The master pacemaker has to be constantly reset so that we are always in sync with the outside world. Okay, So the way that that happens is that we use light as our reference point. So light provides the primary input into the circadian system. And light actually sets the body clock to the correct time, metaphorically, which is a process called photoentrainment, which means that your circadian rhythm becomes aligned with external factors such as the rhythm of light and dark. And the way that that works in mammals is that light sensitive cells within the eye actually act as a brightness detector sending messages about environmental light levels directly to the SCN. And then the SCN uses that information to coordinate the activity of the entire circadian rhythm. We're gonna look at how that works now in, a, in an example that's probably the most familiar circadian rhythm, and that is the sleep-wake cycle. Okay, so the sleep-wake cycle. When do you sleep? When do you wake up? That's all regulated by your circadian rhythm. Okay, so light and darkness are external signals that determine when we feel the need to sleep and when we feel the need to wake up. Okay, so when it's light outside, 
we know that we need to get up and we feel alert. When it's dark outside, we feel the need to go to sleep and we start to become sleepy. Now, circadian rhythms also dip and rise at certain times of the day. So our strongest sleep drive usually occurs in two dips. So you've got between 2 and 4 a.m. That's when we feel the strongest need to sleep. And between 1 and 3 p.m., which is commonly known as the post-lunch dip. So I'm sure everyone's experienced that before. You have your lunch, you've had maybe a lunch break, you go back to work or you go back to school and you feel very, very sleepy. That is the post-lunch dip that occurs between one and three. Now, the sleepiness that we experience during those dips is less intense if we've had sufficient sleep the night before. And it's obviously more intense when we've had less sleep. Now, sleep and wakefulness are not just determined by circadian rhythms, but they're also under what's known as homeostatic control. Now, what that means is that if you've been awake for a long period of time, homeostasis tells you that the need for sleep is increasing because of how much energy you've been using whilst being awake. That drive for sleep, that homeostatic drive for sleep, increases gradually throughout the day, and then it reaches its maximum in the late evening, which is when most people fall asleep. Makes sense because in the late evening, that's when you've been awake the longest and you've used up the most energy, so you start to become the most sleepy. So actually, the sleep-wake cycle is under the control of two different systems. You've got the circadian system, which keeps you awake as long as there is daylight present, and then prompts you to go to sleep when it gets dark. But then you've also got the homeostatic system, which tends to make us sleepier as time goes on throughout a period of you being awake, regardless of whether it's day or night. Now, your internal circadian clock is described as free running, which means that it will maintain a cycle of 24 or 25 hours, even in the absence of external cues. So even if there is no light or darkness available to you, your internal body clock will still make sure that you have a 24 or 25 hour circadian rhythm. That is the homeostatic control that we were just talking about. That being said, your circadian system is very, very intolerant of any major alterations in sleep and wake schedules. So, for example, if you are in shift work or if you um, travel a lot and experience jet lag, your body won't like that because that causes your body clock, your biological clock, and the major internal physiological systems that are dependent on the body clock to become completely out of balance. Now there are also other circadian rhythms in your body which I'll quickly tell you about. So you've also got core body temperature. Your core body temperature is at its lowest as you can see on the chart in front of you there at about 36 degrees at about 4:30 in the morning and it's at its highest at about 38 degrees at about 6 p.m. now during a normal circadian rhythm sleep occurs when the core temperature begins to drop and body temperature begins to rise during the last hours of sleep promoting feelings of alertness in the morning A small drop in body temperature also occurs in most people between 2 p.m. and 4 p.m., which may explain why many people feel sleepy in the early afternoon. Remember that post-lunch dip. Another circadian rhythm, which is important for sleep and wake, is hormone production. For example, the production and the release of melatonin from the pineal gland in the brain. So the peak levels of melatonin production occur during the hours of darkness. So by activating chemical receptors in the brain, melatonin encourages feelings of sleep. So when it's dark, more melatonin is produced. And then when it's light again, the production of melatonin drops 
and the person becomes awake and becomes more alert. Okay, so again, hormone production is very, very important, circadian rhythm, and is important for the sleep-wake cycle. Okay, so before we finish, I've just got a couple of evaluation points for you. So let's take a little look at them. So the first one is a strength, and that is that research into circadian rhythms has some very good real-life applications. So one of those real-world applications is something called chronotherapeutics, which is the study of how timing affects drug treatments. Um, so you can read the evaluation point through for yourselves. However, the message of the point is that the research has allowed us to realize that the specific time that patients take their medication is very important, and it can have a significant impact on treatment success. So an example of that is that the risk of heart attacks is greatest during the early morning hours after waking up. Therefore, chronotherapeutic medications have been developed with a new drug delivery system. And that means that certain medications can be administered before the person goes to sleep at around 10 p.m., but the actual drug isn't released until the vulnerable period of 6 a.m. to noon. So research into circadian rhythms has actually led to the improvement of treatment for patients with a variety of conditions that require drug therapy, which is great. Okay, moving on, another strength, we have a case study. Case study evidence for a free-running circadian rhythm. So you've got a man called Michel Sif, who's a French cave explorer, and he on several occasions has spent long periods of time living underground because he wanted to study his own circadian rhythm. Um, so we're talking two months at a time, six months at a time, um, and so on. When he is underground, he has no external cues to guide his rhythms, so no daylight, no clocks, no radio, you know, nothing like that. So he simply wake, wakes up, eats, and then sleeps when he feels that it's appropriate to do so. So the only thing that was actually influencing his behavior was his internal body clock, i.e. his free-running body clock. And in his studies, he found that Almost every time his natural circadian rhythm settled at around 24 to 25 hours, which provides support for the free running circadian rhythm. However, obviously, this is a case study, so make sure that you use your knowledge of case studies and why they are bad. Um, you know, just to kind of throw in as a little bit of a counterpoint here, which would be useful. And then you've also got a weakness that follows on directly from that, and that is the case study thing that we were just talking about, and also the fact that they have fairly small samples. So um, sleep-wake sleep cycle studies tend to involve very small groups of people or single individuals. Um, they might not be representative of the wider population, which means that the generalizability is fairly limited. Um, and for example, in Seif's most recent cave study, at the age of 60, he observed that his internal body clock ticked much more slowly than when he was a young man. So it almost doubled in length, um, which illustrates that even when the same person is involved, there are certain factors that vary, which may prevent general conclusions from being drawn. So that is a limitation of a lot of research into the sleep-wake cycle. Okay, so that is the end of this video. I hope it has been useful. The biopsychology topic is not always the easiest one. Um, so I hope that it's been useful and I hope that everything has made sense. Thank you very much for listening.